Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz and I'm very happy uh, to see all of you tonight. Uh, I think some of our friends are still coming in. Uh, we do a little maintenance housekeeping around here now. Uh, it's just sort of the state of the times. If there is an emergency, and I don't expect there to be one, we will have people directing you to the nearest exits. There are exits behind uh, to the uh, right of Mr. Sanger here. So we'll, we'll make sure you get to where you need to go. But General, we don't expect anything bad. Can we welcome General Skokoff? General Brent Skokoff is here. I have to welcome one of my bosses, and I also would like to welcome uh, Judge William Webster is here as well. Thank you. It, it's been a great day um, at CSIS. Today we hosted uh, Representative Mike McCall, Chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, to discuss cyber threats. Then we had uh, Interior Secretary Sally Jewell talking about uh, the department's uh, energy priorities. And now we've invited Bob Schieffer and Carol Lee to preside over Jake Tapper and David Sanger's bar mitzvah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Bob Schieffer and the Schieffer College of Communication at TCU uh, for their great partnership in bringing us these dialogues. It's been about seven years that we've been partnered with the Horn Frogs and we are proud uh, of that relationship. Um, Um, none of this would be possible without the generosity and support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. We're so appreciative, appreciative of them and all they do for CSIS. Uh, now, without further ado, please join me with your applause in welcoming Bob Schieffer. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I think everybody up here would be much more comfortable if we were sitting out there and Brent Skullcroft and Judge Webster were sitting up here. But be that as it may, we'll, we'll press on. And we hope they'll have good questions. Everybody knows David Sanger uh, down there, uh, Washington correspondent for the New York Times, uh, reported from New York, from Tokyo, uh, uh, on globalization, on foreign policy. Uh, he's been a member of Times reporting teams that uh, have won the Pulitzer before covering the White House. He specialized in uh, confluence of economic and uh, foreign policy and wrote extensively about that. Carol Lee, to my left, uh, is a White House correspondent for the, uh, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she was started out here in Washington, at least at the White House uh, for Politico, but she's one of the few reporters who's been there for the entire uh, Obama uh, uh, administration, so we're glad to have here, and then of course, uh, my friend Jake Tapper here, uh, you all know Jeff, uh, I'm a, uh, Jake, uh, he's the uh, anchor of the lead uh, and uh, is, has a long and distinguished uh, career here. And uh, I, I think I want to start uh, with Jake because I think the first thing we ought to talk about is what's happening in Israel and what the latest is. And I know you just got off the air, so yeah. just bring us up to speed, uh, Jake, on what happened. It's really fascinating. First of all, it's, it's an honor to be here and, 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 and such a pleasure, um, especially sitting next to my colleagues, um, most notably uh, Mr. Schieffer. Um, the, the exit polls, according to, there are three uh, Israeli uh, TV channels that do exit polling. Uh, Channel 2 is the one that CNN went with uh, this year because they have, they have a slightly better track record than the others. Uh, they had uh, Netanyahu and Likud with 28 seats in the parliament. and. Uh, and uh, Herzog with uh, 27. The other two networks have it even, 27, 27. As I'm sure you know, the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, has uh, 120 seats, so you need a coalition of, of 61. No party in Israel's history has ever won 61 votes. So now um, what comes next is, first of all, the actual poll results need to come out, and then the president uh, of Israel, uh, if there is no clear, defined winner uh, in terms of who had the plurality, uh, has to pick. So already uh, gets to pick which party can now has 28 days to form a government. Um, the jockeying has already begun. Uh, Netanyahu has already basically declared victory, uh, even though the actual results haven't come in. Uh, and uh, Herzog and his uh, coalition uh, with Sipi Livni uh, are pushing back, saying this is more Likud um, misleading of the public as to what's going on, because this is very much a perception game in terms of the Israeli president. Uh, some uh, not so surprising, but also just very interesting uh, 
uh, results. Uh, the third place, it appears, uh, is the coalition of Arab parties um, about, with about 13 seats. Uh, and then the two uh, secular center parties uh, have about 11 seats and 10 seats. Again, this is all just exit polls, so who knows. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really don't have official results, and I don't really know exactly what's going to happen yet, uh, and nor does anybody uh, other than Mr. Netanyahu, apparently. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, is, uh, it is fascinating, and if it comes, I, I think what, what would be most interesting would be if it turns out to be 27-27, uh, well, then, and I'd like to bring David into this, too. If, if it winds up like this, who has the best chance of uh, putting together a coalition? Well, that depends in large part on how some of these smaller parties end up. Uh, as Jake points out, the fact that this Arab uh, coalition uh, slate uh, put together, what, 13 seats from the last yeah. that we looked at. In part, this was because of a legal change that was designed to try to keep them largely out uh, of the, the Knesset. And so they came, to, there were so many fragmented Arab parties. And so now they've come together uh, in, in one uh, panel. Um, I would have to say that if you had to bet right now, you would have to bet that the machine that at this point the prime minister has put together would probably cobble this together from the right and some of the some of the others, but you know the president uh, of Israel uh, has no love lost uh, at this point for for Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I think if he can figure out a way that he could uh, begin to put to designate somebody else to try to put a government together, that Herzog could do this with this combination with Tifna Livni, I think he would be inclined to do that. That would be hard to do if it's 28. 27. It would be, I think, a, something he might be able to pull off if it was a tie. Oh, Carol, what do you think? Uh, uh, what are obviously the people at the White House must have been very disappointed. Yes. Uh, when uh, no love lost. Oh, they have, no minister, they have no position, Bob. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but when the prime minister came out, when was it yesterday, or the day before, and said he no longer favors uh, a two-state solution, uh, mm -hmm. which obviously we all know what uh, U.S. policy is on that. Uh, what, what was their thinking over there today? Well, privately, their thinking is that they don't really believe he was ever really for a two-state solution. And that was just his most explicit articulation of the policy they believe he has held for a long time. Um, you know, their view of this election, they've been very cautious about making sure they're not looking like they're weighing in on that. But the White House press secretary and others in the administration made clear that what Netanyahu said was at odds with President Obama's policy. And Secretary Kerry said that he would like to make another go at the peace process and that he hoped, the, while he wasn't weighing in on the election, he hoped that the results would uh, be in favor of pe a peace process and, and coming to some sort of resolution. But the general thinking is that this election, either way it goes, is gonna set the tone for relations between this White House and Israel for the next two years. and. They feel that if Netanyahu were not to be prime minister, that that would be much more uh, beneficial to them because he, while the disagreements would still be there, they would not be as blustery as they have been under this prime minister and whose relationship with President Obama has significantly deteriorated. What do you all think would be, what happens if, if let's say that uh, Netanyahu is able to put together a coalition and now you have uh, the Israeli government saying we no longer favor a two-state solution. What happens after that? Well, to some degree, Bob, you have to think that every time that Prime Minister Netanyahu came here, there was always this question of could they drag him into uttering the words that he was in favor of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. And he, he told um, many other Israeli politicians uh, and some American officials at various times before he came into office this time, uh, that he, was, he would not sign up for it. Then he did reluctantly uh, under great international pressure. And I think what's interesting about this election is that as it came down to the wire uh, in the last three weeks, you saw him move to hardened positions on the two issues that were his signature issues. It was coming here to denounce the uh, Iran agreement before it was 
negotiating, but basically to lay out his, his case uh, against it. As he said, it would pave the way to a bomb in his view rather than, than block it. And then to announce that uh, he was not in favor of the two-state solution and to uh, defend much more vigorously than he had even before his uh, imposition of settlements uh, in places that he knew would be uh, blocking uh, a real negotiated solution. Well, go ahead, Jay. Well, it's just been fascinating. I, I, when I spent, I spent the first four years of Obama uh, as the White House correspondent for ABC News, and it was just fascinating to watch the relationship deteriorate. Um, from the very beginning, I think when uh, Vice President, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna mess up the chronology here, but there was a Biden trip to Israel, and he landed, and immediately new settlements were announced. Uh, there was uh, Netanyahu not being permitted to come through the front door uh, one time, uh, an honor usually reserved for uh, the Dalai Lama, um, and uh, <laughs> in deference to our friends in China, of course. Um, the, uh, and then just, just the, the Netanyahu, what was interpreted by President Obama as Netanyahu lecturing Obama in the Oval Office, and uh, I think it's fair to say that, that the respect that Netanyahu and Obama have for each other knows bounds. Uh, but beyond, beyond that, um, it has affected the relationship. Yes, the defense cooperation, the intelligence cooperation, that continues. There is this uh, undergirding of uh, the two countries uh, being allied. Um, but, but the idea that it's irrelevant, uh, which is something that you hear sometimes from uh, Obama's uh, supporters, uh, that it doesn't really matter that these two don't get along. Of course it matters that these two don't get along. Um, and uh, and, and uh, it, it's, I think, it had very bad consequences, uh, especially but, for Israel. Uh, but, you know, beyond the idea of uh, the impact on U.S. and Israeli relations, how are you going to resolve this problem if it's not a two-state solution? I mean, it's, to me, it's like when we talk about immigration in this country and people say, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> They're against any kind of uh, uh, work permits or anything for all these people. You've got 8 million people in this country. What are you going to do with them? You don't have enough buses to haul them out of here. You can't build enough jails to put them in it. You have to, to be realistic, have to figure out something in a realistic way to deal with it. What do you do with, these, with the Palestinians if there is no two-state solution? Well, I think one of the things that the least in the White House's view is that if Netanyahu were to prevail and continue to be prime minister, there's, there's questions about whether they would even try to restart the peace process. Mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, there were questions whether they were going to do that anyways, um, you know, in the last two years. And so I think that a lot of the policy, that particular issue is really in flux if, if Netanyahu stays, and, he, and even if he doesn't, um, where I think his, the election is really impactful, particularly if he wins for Obama, is on the Iran issue, because if he comes out of this as the victory, as a, if it's a victory for him, then that's going to influence him with Republicans in Congress. He may feel emboldened to go back and get use them further to try to scuttle a deal. I mean, the, all of that. The thinking in the in the administration was that if he went down in this election, that then that whole uh, speech and all of those that his efforts to sway lawmakers in Congress would kind of become less influential. And if that doesn't happen, then that may not be the case. And, and I think that's where the real policy implications would come from. Where, where, do you, where would you see the next thing? What would happen next after that? If, if, uh, if we no longer, or if Israel no longer favors a two-state solution, which government uh, does, uh, David? You'd have a huge demographic issue for uh, the Israelis because the Arab population is obviously growing a lot yeah. faster than the Jewish population is. And at some point, they would end up having to choose between being a Jewish state and being a democracy. And so that's one of the reasons that many in Israel favor a two-state solution as a way to sort of preserve the concept under which Israel was first created. I'm not sure a two state, I mean, a Jewish state is possible unless you have a two state. Two state solution. I'm not sure I mean, it is. It would. Well, it, it can't. I remember a professor of mine in college, so this is quite some time ago, telling me that Israel cannot be the same size it is now, Jewish, and a democracy uh, in perpetuity. Like, at, at least one of those things has to change. Mm -hmm. um, and 
right now, it seems like the Israeli leadership, uh, the current Israeli leadership, the Netanyahu government, uh, thinks that the status quo is the only viable option. Um, and unless there is a hue and cry for full voting rights or few, full human rights in some cases for uh, the millions of Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, um, I don't see evidence that that's not true. Um, I'm not saying that that's what I would pick if I were in charge of the world and got to snap my fingers and change things, but uh, they seem to think that this is, this is it. This is what, this is the solution is they live in the West Bank and these people live in Gaza and we have as little to do with them as possible and they don't get to vote. Okay, let's talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, negotiations with Iran. Uh, you followed that very closely, David, for a long, long time. Where do you think we are? Uh, the word out of, uh, out of there today was that uh, they think they're getting closer. The Iranians seem to say, seem to be more positive and optimistic than the Americans. But. That's exactly right, Bob. The Iranians were giving a very positive spin, and you have to wonder, was that because they were really getting closer or because if it does fall apart, that they wanted to establish a narrative that they were, they were ready and the United States uh, was not. So a couple of interesting features of this. First of all, politically, Secretary Kerry has put himself in an interesting position because he has gotten to the point now of being the day-to-day -day negotiator here, rather than coming in as the closer, which would be the usual kind of expectation. And that's a tough spot because this is not the kind of negotiation where the president himself can come in and be the closer. So um, Secretary Kerry is going to be out there all this week. We expect that if there is no agreement by Friday, and I could look foolish for this on Friday, but I think it would take a miracle to have it all together by then. He'll come back for a few days. He's got um, uh, President Ghani coming from Afghanistan. Uh, and then uh, he'll probably go back and try to hit this deadline of, of March 31st. A couple of big issues to go look for. First of all, there's the continuing argument about the number of centrifuges that will be allowed to be spinning, what you heard a lot about when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu came. But in some ways, that's less important than uh, the questions of what they would do to configure those in a way that they could not turn out much bomb grade uranium, and there are all kinds of ways, technological ways, to go about doing that. And the advantage is you have the face-saving element for the Iranians that they're allowed to keep thousands of centrifuges, but you have the technological limits on it. The difficulty for Secretary Kerry is that's a very difficult thing to explain. It's very easy to go on TV and say you have left the Iranians with thousands of centrifuges, and it's very hard for him to sort of come back and say, but no, if you understood the physics of this, this is harder to make into bomb grade fuel. Inspections are a very difficult issue right now because um, if you were really going to cut off the covert pathway, you would need to have a far more intrusive inspection regime than we've ever seen in any country, including the ability to go on to military bases, which the Iranians and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps has opposed. And research and development is very important because the Iranians are working away on some very advanced centrifuges. They'd like to be in the position that when this agreement expires, whether it's 10 years or 12 years or 15 years from now, uh, and Bob has us back up here to ask, answer the question, how did this all work out, right? Mm -hmm. um, that at that moment, they want to be ready to go with a very large capacity. And the US wants to make sure that work on these centrifuges stops. So those are the big areas of disagreement. Politically, I think almost anything that Secretary Kerry comes back with is going to be under immediate attack by the Republicans and some Democrats. And so you have to think of this not as one negotiation, but three. There's the easy one between Kerry and Zarif. There's the hard one between uh, President Obama and the Congress. And there's an equally hard one between President Rouhani and the clerics and the generals. Well, I was going to say that's part of why you saw the White House today playing down the prospects of a deal that they were close. And one of the reasons that they gave was because the big X factor is what you know, the Ayatollah is at the White House thinks he's the ultimate decider and they don't know what he's going to do or say or whether this will fly with the, the Iranians leadership, Iran's leadership. So 
that's, and there, then there's the general uh, design. The White House is very reluctant to raise expectations on something like this. And any time you're getting closer to a deal like this, it's just all of the political forces start to really get cooked up again. And you know they're concerned about that, and they're really trying to manage that as they do. But with this opposition that we saw, you know, beginning with this extraordinary uh, letter uh, that uh, 47 Republicans signed. Which came up in the talks this week. And which actually came up in the talks. How is the White House going to be able to assure the American people that this is safe and this is, uh, this is in their interest for, for us to sign on to a deal like this? Well, that's going to be a big, heavy lift for the president. He said he'll do that when and if there is a deal. Um, but first, he's going to have to get Congress to hold off on some things. And I think in the administration's view, that letter gave them a bit of a reprieve because what was building as a very large bipartisan coalition in Congress around Senator Corker's bill, for instance, which would give the Senate an up or down vote on whether or not to approve any final deal. That coalition is sort of fracturing, and it started to fracture after Netanyahu's speech to Congress because some Democrats were, had felt just things were getting a little too partisan, and then they doubled down on that uh, the following week with this letter. And you know, not every Republican signed it, but most of them did. No Democrats signed it, and that helped the White House a little bit with this job that they have to do, which is to get Congress not to, well, well the President will veto any of those bills. He's already said that. But what Corker's been working towards is this veto-proof majority. And the view, at least in the White House right now, is that that letter took some of the momentum out of that. Do you all, uh, is it your sense that uh, in the end that Congress will vote in some way on this? I think well, so. Well, they have to I on the so. sanctions, at least. Yeah. They'll uh, have to vote on what to do about the sanctions, but it's just to whether they, they will approve or disapprove this. Yeah, I, I can't underscore enough. Absolutely, I, I think so, Bob. But I can't underscore enough what, what Carol just said about how much the Cotton Letter uh, hurt Corker's efforts to get a bipartisan majority veto proof uh, to, to, to stand and, and say Congress needs to be part of this. There, there are so many Democrats who have serious concerns about this deal. Um, not just the deal as it's being negotiated now, but the framework that was established uh, a, a year or so ago. Um, the idea that the, the deal cooks in, it's already cooked in that Iran, as opposed to in UN resolutions, that Iran uh, gets to enrich uranium, gets to manufacture plutonium, uh, and that, again, as opposed to what, what you, the UN, UN would have required, or the UN Security Council, that Iran, that there was this deadline, whether it's 20 years or 15 years, uh, as opposed to what the UN said, which was it would depend upon Iran's behavior, and, and then more could happen in terms of sanctions being lifted or whatever. And the idea that the administration was, was pushing forward a deal that was, in the view of many Democrats, weaker than what the UN had put forward uh, made a lot of them very, very nervous. I think what Carol and Jake just laid out is absolutely right, but I think the president's argument is gonna end up focusing on the question, compared to what? So what happens if we just walk away from this? You know, the, what was it Bob Gates who always used to say, the, the, three, the three words never asked enough in Washington are, and then what? And uh, so let's do the and then what's here, which is, which is, ex helps explain why the president finds himself in the position he's in. If there's no deal, then the temporary agreement that was in place to allow the negotiation would expire on June 30th. At that point, the US would be free to ramp up sanctions as much as it wanted. The Iranians would be free to ramp up their production of uranium and produce plutonium for the first time at the uh, reactor at Iraq as much as they want. And then you're off to the races. And this is why the White House argument was, you know, the, the Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he came, didn't offer an alternative proposal. The wedge this puts the White House in, though, 
is that almost anything they negotiate will look better than letting the Iranians go off and produce whatever they're going to produce after June 30th. And so it somewhat relieves them of the responsibility of, is this the best deal you could get? And that's the hardest thing for the president, I think, to explain. Can any of you, do any of you have the inside story of how this letter came about? I mean, was this just one rookie senator who came up with this idea? Was this something that senior members of his party put him up to? Uh, I, I find the whole thing, I mean, I know I'm showing my age, but when I came to Washington, people just didn't do things like that. <laughs> it, it, it just wasn't the way things worked. And, and, and suddenly this pops up and, and, and 46 of his colleagues signed the letter along with him. Uh, does anybody have any idea how this thing came about? Well, Jake interviewed him, right? I did, but that was an on-camera interview. So <laughs> it, 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 the on-camera explanation is that he came up with this letter and, and passed it around. But I share your skepticism that this was the brainchild of somebody who had been in office for 60 days as opposed to some larger movement and somebody said, let's go with the decorated Iraq and Afghanistan war veteran and see mm -hmm. if, if, he'll, he'll, if he'll be in charge. Also, having interviewed him several times, uh, he was remarkably, uh, when I interviewed him, on message and concise, uh, which usually uh, does not uh, necessarily suggest authorship. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but well, this is just conjecture. This is just conjecture. Well, you know, I, uh, you know, he was on Face the Nation Sunday, and I found him remarkably composed. Uh, he uh, he made a very pr good presentation, and and he did not just give talking points. He actually uh, seemed to try to answer the questions. The only question he really didn't give a definitive answer to was when I asked him, did he plan to contact any of our other adversaries, North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, which seemed like a logical follow-up. <laughs> uh, I think he believes it. I mean, I don't think any of the 47 who, who, who signed it disagree with the letter. <laughs> well, there was some regret, you know, there was some regret about whether it should have been addressed to Iranian, Iran's leaders as opposed to an open yeah, letter to the Why not an open like letter in the Wall Street Journal? Or, I mean, you know, I mean, the remarkable thing me, here is it's the jump the gun element of it. And I think that Secretary Kerry has the best argument that he can muster right now is wait until you actually have an agreement before you start criticizing it. The problem the administration is going to run into is that come March 31st, one of three things is going to happen. Either there'll be no agreement, in which case we're off to the scenario I described before. There will be an agreement, but the State Department will say we're not ready to provide you with the text of it, in which case they'll be doing private briefings in Congress which I hope would leak to the four of us within mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 seconds. Um, uh, if not, we should all be fired. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the third option is that they actually do release the text. And that's going to then change the debate because then both Democrats and Republicans will have something on which to base their critique. And you know, there are some legitimate critiques out here. Uh, but that's going to be a very hard question for the secretary to decide whether to publish this that early. And one other thing on the letter, the, one of the big concerns the White House had with it is that if negotiations fall apart, if Iran walks away from the table, their concern is that it gives them a reason to blame the United States for that. And that their, their view is that the blame game is very important because if Iran, if Iran is not to blame for talks blowing up, then it's, they won't be able to hold together the kind of international coalition that they've had to tighten the screws, to put more pressure. And, and so that's one of the things that they were, very, they were concerned about in terms of how that would impact. I find, it I, just, I find it impossible. David knows much more about this, so I defer to him. But I find it impossible to believe that Iran would walk away from this deal. Yeah, the Iranians have a lot to gain from doing a deal here, because they really want, I mean, Rouhani was elected to get rid of these sanctions. And uh, their oil revenues were down by more than half before the price of oil dropped. So they're under an awful lot of pressure. Uh, 
to get the deal together, and I suspect that uh, they will try to do it. But they do want to make sure, as Carol points out, that if the deal doesn't happen, the blame's on the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a significant well, risk. Well, uh, with your great uh, follow-up question, uh, and then what, should Iran expect tougher sanctions if this deal falls apart? I mean, that seems like that's going to be almost a given. They would get tougher U.S. sanctions, but let's face it, this is like us trying to put additional sanctions on North Korea as we did after the, the cyber attacks. There's not a whole lot left for the U.S. to sanction on Iran. We've, if there's a good sanction on Iran, believe me, somebody's thought of it in the past 36 years, right? So what's that leave? It leaves the other part of the program that the U.S. doesn't talk about. When you ask U.S. officials, they say they came to the table because of the sanctions. Well, half right. They came to the table because of the sanctions and because of the sabotage. Okay, and the sabotage program against uh, Iran is a long one. You've read about some of it in the New York Times and elsewhere, and it's been everything from giving them bad parts to giving them uh, a bad, bad computer code, which destroyed a thousand centrifuges in Natanz. So what that would leave the U.S. and Israel is the option of trying to step up the sabotage, because doing something directly from the air uh, or on the ground would trigger another conflict, and that's obviously exactly what the president's trying to avoid. What happens now on uh, on uh, getting uh, authorization for a military strike? Uh, the next thing. Will this Congress give that to the president? My sense of it is that that's looking kind of remote right now. It is looking kind of remote. I mean, part of the reason why the White House, you know, they'll say that this agreement is not a treaty and doesn't require congressional approval. They don't want to send anything to Congress because the Congress can barely keep the lights on. And mm -hmm. beyond doing anything yeah, beyond that, that, you know, that gets past that, it's just, it's a real question mark. And so any kind of very serious issue that the president holds close, which, you know, you can, I really can't think of, and Jake, you probably would agree with this, there isn't a foreign policy issue that this president cares more about than getting something, a new deal with Iran. But it, yeah. it, the, the relationship between the Congress and the White House, to me, seems about as bad as it could get right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's worse than it's ever been, back to the days when, and, John Boehner wasn't even taking Obama's phone, President Obama's phone calls. Uh, it's 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 stunning. It's interesting. I mean, the um, the administration looks at the the Tom Cotton letter uh, and in through the perspective of the authorization for use of military for, force against ISIS and 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 uh, and says so they want to micromanage every single thing we do to try to achieve peace in a treaty, but when it comes to war, have at it whatever you want to do in whatever country. Uh, how do you square that? You need to talk to Republicans in the Senate and they'll say, we want to, the president to keep us safe. And that, in, that means waging war however he needs to do it and um, not signing off on this, on this treaty. But uh, they don't even understand how the other one thinks the Republicans in the in Congress and, and the, this White House. Well, and also uh, Republicans in various camps. I mean, uh, I, I think it'd be very difficult for John Boehner to get his Republican caucus united on, on a number of things, and I think the same thing holds true uh, in the Senate. No, I, I think that's true, and, and to your question, could you imagine an, an authorization for the use of force in Iran? I can't, but think about this, they're having a hard time for reasons that in both parties, getting uh, a continued authorization for use of military force that uh, would help against ISIS here. And in the Syria case, when the president thought about and then pulled back from that missile attack, it was clear that neither Republicans or Democrats in Congress were going to approve that as well. So, you know, the Congress is caught between wanting, or the Republicans caught between wanting to portray the president as weak not standing up for the United States enough, and on the other hand, not wanting to go the route that they saw President Bush take. Yeah, they don't want to vote either. No. I mean, a lot of they don't want to vote no. either. Yeah, but they don't want to take hard votes. Yeah, I and mean, when you think about, uh, I mean, they're both right in how they criticize the other. Uh, the, the, 
it is difficult discerning a coherent foreign policy objective, and especially when it comes to use of force in the administration right now. President Obama clearly feels very ambivalent and torn about it. I have no idea, and maybe somebody here can help me understand what we're doing with our troops in Afghanistan. I thought that they were supposed to have been gone by now, but now we're being told that that's being reconsidered and, and dates are being reconsidered in Afghanistan. That's not a public discussion that the, that the administration's having with Congress or the American people. It's kind of just, you know, you learn about it by reading the New York Times. And, and uh, conversely, as you point out with the Syria escapade, uh, it wasn't as if the president taking it to Congress was the clear option to do. It looked like he was going to lose that. So even when the president's critics, I think, with reason, criticize him for walking away from the red line, he was about to have what happened to him what happened uh, to David Cameron in the UK. They were about to vote it down. Let's talk a little bit about Russia. Uh, number one, uh, do any of you uh, have any information on where Mr. Putin <laughs> has been? <laughs> I have to tell you, I heard one of the, uh, one of the late night comics saying uh, that they thought he had a boob job. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was a joke. <laughs> to be candid, he needs one. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no? Let's talk about aid to Ukraine. Do you all see the administration and the Congress coming together on, on this issue? Uh, is there going to be aid to Ukraine or not? And what's going on there? Well, on the lethal aid question, the president's made it pretty clear that he doesn't see an advantage in uh, doing this. By the way, talking about uh, Russia and how to handle it when you're sitting 20 feet from Brent Scowcroft, it's just it's not a good idea, okay? <laughs> so discount whatever I say, or Brent, cover your ears. Um, so um, the president clearly does not want to go do the lethal aid. And uh, one of the reasons is that he believes we don't have what in the academic world they call escalation dominance. Anything that we provide, it's a lot easier for the Russians to go and match. I think the fear that I hear the most in the intelligence world these days is that uh, President Putin's strategy may well be one of make some advances, declare another ceasefire, um, proclaim that the Minsk Accord, which calls the ceasefire, is a brilliant solution, pull back for a few months until the headlines shift elsewhere, gain another 100 kilometers, declare another ceasefire, and make this work until he's gone down and rejoined you know, his land bridge with Crimea. And that may well be a strategy. And if it is, I'm not sure it's one that the West in any way can actually stop. I mean, they're not a member of NATO. The US is not, and NATO are not going to come to great military aid. I haven't heard a plan for the lethal aid to the Ukrainians that sounds like it's convincing that it would change the nature of the fight. Yeah, I think, well, there's, there are folks in the administration who favor mil supplying lethal aid, uh, particularly if this current agreement is significantly violated. Um, but the doing so raises a whole bunch of questions like, you know, how much, how quickly would it get there, and most importantly, how would Vladimir Putin respond? And those questions have been enough to give President Obama pause at, to this point. But even if they were to get to a point where he was receiving, you know, a, a, group, a very strong majority of advice from his advisors to do this, there's still a big chance he's a cautious president. He's not inclined to do this kind of thing. And there's still a chance that he would ultimately say no. And, you know, by the way, the, you're, you know, he was here with Angela Merkel not that long ago, and she opposes it. And he, it's one of his favorite leaders in the world. They, he gets along with her very well. They have a close relationship. And he values her opinion and listens to her pretty closely. And so that, that is also influencing how he's thinking, too. We, uh, uh, we'll go, let's go to the audience now uh, uh, for some uh, questions. But let me just ask uh, you two, how is the war, as we're going to be thinking of your question, how is this whole situation with ISIS going? It's going as well as can be expected without ground troops. Uh, and I don't mean necessarily US ground troops, but you have the Peshmerga, you have what passes for the Iraqi military. The Syrian Free Army is still not really any sort of force that, that has, plays any sort of role. Uh, 
Um, and uh, you know, the U.S. had its first uh, casualty uh, in Iraq in the, in the fight against ISIS. It came from a bullet fired from uh, the, uh, the Iraqi side of a camp and accidentally hitting an American soldier on guard duty. Um, so as of now, uh, you know, the air campaign continues and uh, the American people are scared of ISIS but not necessarily engaged in the day to day and U.S. troops aren't coming home in bags. I think that they can, they, the administration feels like they can, they can ride this out until there is some sort of, uh, there is some sort of uh, mm -hmm. cogent force on the ground. I'll tell you who needs that lethal aid though is the, is the, is the Kurdish fighters. Uh, that's who could really stand the, the lethal aid that we're not providing to the Ukrainians. All right, well, let's go to the audience now. Uh, General Scowcroft, would you like to say something? Just make an observation. <laughs> Factual errors to be corrected. <laughs> well, if you do, feel free to. Right here in the green shirt. Microphone? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for your discussion. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Colonel John Oakley. I'm at the National War College here in Washington, D.C. Right. And, and I'd like you to uh, uh, address a particular issue, uh, not a current hot spot, but a potential future hot spot, uh, and that's dealing with the Arctic. Uh, we have a lot of nations which are calling themselves Arctic nations or close Arctic nations as China is. So I'd like your thoughts on uh, the future as you see it um, from, your, from your viewpoint on the Arctic. Thank you. Well, I'm going to have to say I'm kind of a fair weather soldier on this one. <laughs> this is something I know absolutely nothing about. But who, Can I make that claim yeah, too? Yeah, all right. <laughs> who, who would like to talk about I, it? I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, I would certainly say that um, you are seeing countries make claims. Um, and, you know, the joke that's going around is that if you get enough global warming, you know, rolling, you're going to be able to actually have navies that will roll Right, right into the territory that you're uh, you're worried about, um, but I think it's sort of a long-range problem at this point. I mean, when you look at both the the Russian and the Chinese strategies right now, the Chinese are much more focused on the South China Sea and the Senkakus. Um, we've seen the Russians trying to do greater patrols that would sort of intimidate the Europeans. So. I think you've got a, it's a 10 or 20 year problem out, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's an imminent problem. Although I will, I do know one thing, and that is that this is something that President Obama pays attention to. And the understanding is that he actually would like to visit the Arctic before he really? takes office. Yes. I don't it's think there's ever been a presidential it's trip on to his the Arctic. Bucket has list. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the How's Colonel, that? you never know yeah. what you're going to get for an answer. <laughs> right behind you there. Go ahead. Uh, Peter Humphrey, former diplomat, current analyst. Uh, the one I lose sleep over is uh, the, the Southeast Asian islands. Isn't it time for some adult supervision to formally divide up all those islands and prevent a major, even a global war that could result from the failure to do so? Big, big question is who provides that adult supervision? So, you know, the Chinese have made it pretty clear they want us to stay out. Um, the Chinese strategy uh, for establishing a presence there, both the air defense uh, zone that they uh, created and then the, uh, the naval zones they're creating, uh, is one that I think the Asian pivot is designed to counter, but it doesn't solve the territorial issue on which the U.S. has said can only be resolved by the individual parties. And, um, you know, I thought today's news from the Chinese sort of gave you another part of this strategy. Um, you saw uh, last week Britain and today uh, Germany and France and Italy all sign on to this Asian infrastructure uh, bank, which is an alternative to the World Bank, or the Chinese portray it as an addition to the World Bank. Well, where's this infrastructure going? Their concept for it is throughout Southeast Asia so that they begin to establish much more of an economic as well as a military presence. It's actually fairly similar to what the Japanese strategy was in infrastructure when the Japanese economy could still sustain it, when I was uh, uh, living back uh, in Tokyo. And um, I think that is going to be the longer term problem here. I think the Chinese will continue to press their claims, but won't actually 
take over much of this territory. I could well be wrong on it. But that they're going to try to surround it, both militarily and economically. OK. Over here somewhere. Any uh, ladies? There's all men here. There's one right there, OK. I have actually two questions that are somewhat related. One is that uh, I haven't heard you discuss our sort of path to endless war, which we seem to be on, and how that affects the economy. And also, I see almost no coverage of the fact that we have more refugees than at any time since World War II. And aside from the humanitarian disaster this is creating, it's also a breeding ground for terrorists. Gentlemen, who'd like to talk about that? Well, the endless war, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. I, I just find me the major presidential candidate who's going to stop it. I suppose one could argue that Rand Paul um, as a, is, is uh, or Bernie Sanders, uh, if they ever were to get those nominations. Um, but I, I find it uh, impossible to perceive uh, Bernie Sanders getting the nomination. And I think if Rand Paul actually poses a strong challenge, as he potentially could, I think a lot of people in the Republican foreign policy establishment will stand up and do everything they can to try to not let him get out of South Carolina or Nevada during the primaries. Um, I, I think that where the parties are politically, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush, uh, are um, very supportive of the current defense budget, uh, very supportive of um, involvement abroad uh, in situations such as combating ISIS or the next field, which is going to be in Africa in terms of fighting uh, terrorism there, whether or not it poses a, a serious uh, threat to the domestic, to, to, to the United States homeland. So, I, I, I would just say, realistically speaking, I don't think whoever the next president is, and, and not this, is going to turn, just turn away and just suddenly withdraw. I, I just don't think that that's going to happen. And uh, there are no American, quote, ground troops, unquote. But I think America is going to be involved uh, a long, long time. And particularly, the Islamic State has really tested folks like Rand Paul's non-interventionist theories. And you know that's going to be an issue for him. I think if that had, he was really gaining a lot of momentum in that view until the Islamic, until a year ago. And, and now that's a little bit dampened. Your point about the refugee crisis is, though, is also very well taken. Yes. Those are breeding grounds, and whether it's in the, the Syrian refugee camps or what's going on in Gaza right now or any number of other horrific places, uh, you're right, um, and <coughs> more should be done. Well, I mean, the, the key to solving the refugee problem is to get people to stop fighting. I mean, that's, that's, that's if we can do that, then there won't be any more refugees. Yes, right here. Go ahead. Uh, Bob Kupay from uh, Independent Damage Control. I'd like to ask David, oh, sorry. Uh, David, what about the uh, reported failing health of the supreme leader in Iran? Uh, some people have said that the Council of Experts could, in fact, pick the next successor to the Ayatollah, and that he could, in fact, be harder to get an agreement with. Well. You know, we don't know a whole lot about this system, and uh, this council of experts now has sort of a hardliner who's been put uh, in charge of it. Um, we don't have a full sense yet of what we know that the Supreme Leader has allowed this negotiating team to go out and negotiate this deal. He's done that sometimes in the past, and they brought back deals, a much smaller one in 2009, that he then rejected. So he leaves himself open that option. And that has to do with this vague constellation of IRGC generals and the Quds Force and other mullahs who are influencing uh, him to some degree. But he recognizes that the majority of the population at this point very much wants to get rid of the sanctions and doesn't really care about the details of the nuclear uh, infrastructure as much. Whether the next uh, supreme leader would have the same view is, you know, sort of hard to know. And while they might take a harder line, at the same time, 
They're, they were very spooked by 2009 and the rest of this on the streets. And that's their long-term threat. Another question? Back over here. Peter Pennington, uh, JGB, just a good bloke. Um, <laughs> earlier this week, in this very room, Senator John Warner, or retired Secretary for the Navy John Warner, posed a question to the three heads of the sea services, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. He pointed out that throughout the Cold War, there were always semi-official, unofficial links between the heads of the services here and their counterparts <coughs> in Soviet Russia. He asked the three heads, did such links exist today? There was a long silence, a very long silence. And eventually, Admiral Greenert said he could talk to his counterpart in China any time. There were no such links into modern Russia. Would the panel like to put an interpretation on that? Well, I think that's probably right. Would be, <laughs> <laughs> would be my interpretation of that. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that just uh, underlines the uh, dangerous world that we live in right now. I, and I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Senator Warner is absolutely right. There used to be some pretty strong links, and that was always a good, not back channel, but it was, it was a channel. And uh, I, it worries me now that maybe those channels are not as strong as they used to be. In, in a, few uh, a few years ago, you wouldn't have been able to even say that about the Chinese. You remember that after uh, the visits of the Dalai Lama and um, arms sales to Taiwan, we had about a two-year down period where there was sort of very little military-to-military -military, uh, relationship, which came back some in the last months of um, Secretary Gates' time at, at defense and then through Leon Panetta's time. Um, but with Russia, the chance for miscalculation is so much greater now that they are out doing these active patrols that we discussed before. And in some cases, at least for the aircraft, they've, they've turned off some of their air identification as well. And you know that's, that's how stupid things happen. All right, one last question right here. Uh, Steve Winters, a local researcher. Uh, since uh, I don't think we mentioned uh, China particularly yet, we had a talk here a few days ago, at, right here, and it was mentioned that the China experts are suddenly getting back to this idea that China may be on the brink. There was a very striking article by David Shambao in the, Washington, uh, the Wall Street Journal, probably all familiar with. Uh, uh, in parallel to this, you know, ISIS seems to be metastasizing all over the globe. Uh, is, how, how is the situation in DC with this paralysis in the government in effect, I mean, or at least splits? How is this a tenable situation faced with these massive possible catastrophes that people are predicting for the near term? Well, I mean, I would just say, uh, I would quote Bob Gates, I would quote Leon Panetta. The greatest danger to US security right now is our inability to make decisions and the whole decision-making process and the paralysis from one end and the disconnect between Capitol Hill of, and, the, and, and the White House. I, I think that is our foremost uh, security threat. I, would anyone disagree with that? No, I mean, cybersecurity is obviously the, yeah. the one thing that uh, they also talk about when they talk about big threats to this country. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all very much on behalf of TCU and CSIS. Thanks for coming.